VTEC, baby! What the hell does it mean? Variable valve timing lift electronic control. It also means you're smoking that Impreza next to you. But why? You've heard the term. You've seen the memes. You've heard the growl. Shit! Hey! 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 And you're well aware that this little four-letter acronym launched Honda as a brand into the hearts and minds of millions of fans across the world. This one brilliant piece of engineering unleashed variable valve timing to the masses and changed the shape of combustion engines forever. What's up guys, it's your boy Trav. Today we're talking VTEC. Let's get into it. Let's pretend for a second that you own a huge car company that primarily makes money building cheap but reliable economy cars. You've played around with sports cars and dreamt of going racing in the past, but the stars just never aligned. Then one day you wake up and you see that basically all your competitors are making quick, fun versions of their ordinarily mundane cars. And you want in. See, you don't own just any car company, no. You're running Honda. Japan's golden child when it comes to internal combustion engines. So it should be no big deal to get your engineers together and come up with a way to jump on board with this now revived fun car craze, right? There's a catch though. See, in Japan, consumers get taxed annually on engine displacement, meaning that you could build a big, powerful engine, but no one's gonna buy it simply because it'll cost a fortune to register year over year. Or you could keep a smaller displacement engine and do something like add a turbocharger to it. Go check out the turbocharger versus supercharger video right up here. Trouble is, at the time anyway, turbochargers were expensive, complicated, and comparatively unreliable. Not a great look for a company that's literally built itself on a reputation for reliability. So you need to keep building small, lightweight, fuel efficient engines and somehow find a way to extract more power out of them without using forced induction. Hmm. You could use a big aggressive race car cam, but then fuel efficiency goes right out the window. Variable displacement isn't even close to working. And it's not like you can start selling every new Accord and Civic with a lifetime supply of nitrous. It'd be pretty cool though. So being the mechanical genius you are, you look towards the past to find a way forward. And you find it with variable valve timing. Variable valve timing had been a nut engine builders across the globe had been trying to crack since like the early 1900s. Doing things like using camshafts that slide back and forth or cams that physically oscillate closer and further to the rocker arm or even cam lobes that could rotate around the camshaft itself using springs and oil pressure. None of those designs proved to be any of the things Honda was looking for when it came to their engine. See, unlike those versions of the system, Honda's design was simple, elegant, and most importantly, reliable. The boys at Honda had started playing around with valve timing tech a few years back on their motorcycles, and it was working. Normally, you've got one camshaft lobe per valve. Cars with VTEC, though, have a trick up their sleeve. In between every set of valves, you have an additional rocker arm, a bigger, longer duration cam lobe, and a little pin that can lock the whole thing together. Pretty simple design, right? If you guys want to see more of how a valve train like this actually works, go check out the video we did on it up here. But what you need to know is when you stomp on the gas, that bigger cam lobe engages and lets more air into the engine. It opens the intake valve sooner, further, and longer than the normal lobe. That's what actually happens when VTEC kicks in. It switches to that more aggressive cam and it feels like hitting a mushroom in Mario Kart. Jesus! Honda gave VTEC to the world in 1989 with an engine internally titled the B16A. Japan got it wrapped in the body of an Integra. Most of Europe got it in a Civic or a CRX. Us Americans, though, wouldn't get a taste until Honda launched their first supercar, the NSX, in 1991 under the Acura Mark. Story for another time. I feel an overdrive video coming on. Where's Squid at? Hello. Everything changed with VTEC. You could go buy a sensible, reliable Japanese econo car that your parents would approve of, and then have it behave like a stabbed rat when you wanted it to. 
the girl you marry and the stripper, all wrapped up into one. The benefits are undeniable. You get none of the downsides of forced induction or big displacement, but a lot of the upsides. When an engine's turning low RPM, say like under three or 4,000, a cam profile that opens the valves just enough to keep the engine running is sort of what we're looking for. The goal here is to use as little fuel as possible, which means you only need a little amount of air. Open the taps though, and you want as much air and fuel as you can cram into it. More air, more fuel, more power. It's just that simple. Since air volume in your engine is almost exclusively controlled by the camshaft, to get the best of both worlds, you need more than one cam profile. Otherwise, you end up with something like a muscle car with a huge cam that barely runs at idle and is wildly inefficient until higher up in the rev range, or literally runs like your refrigerator. Not cool. See what I did there? <laughs> Honda started sticking it in everything. That's where the whole Honda bro culture started. VTEC was a way to make powerful little cars that you could tune and brought them to the grubby hands of the average young car enthusiast. The Integra GS, the Del Sol, Integra Type R, Civic R, Prelude, and even one or two Accords, Honda was just going crazy with VTEC and opening the door for companies like Spoon and Mugen to get in on the small fast car craze. Everyone else was playing a lot of catch up on the cheap car scene which they did, but more on that in a moment. It kind of all culminated with the K20, which is easily one of Honda's most legendary engines. If you've ever been around a Honda bro, you've probably heard that engine code before. Today, you can't even buy a Honda that doesn't have VTEC, except now it's called IVTEC. And as of last few years, they finally gave in and started using turbochargers like the rest of the world. Regular old VTEC relied basically on RPM signal as for when to change over to that high lift, long duration profile. As long as the engine was warmed up and the throttle position sensor indicated it was go time, VTEC kicked in, yo. IVTEC is capable of making the switch whenever the engine computer deems it's advantageous and it uses a camshaft variator, so it can, in real time, make small micro adjustments to camshaft overlap, just like other manufacturers have been doing for years. Take BMW, for example. Vanos, which probably deserves its own video, started using a variator type adjuster somewhere in the early 90s, not long after Honda rolled out VTEC. Vanos, though, wasn't capable of changing valve lift, and this is important just valve timing. That meant while you could get the benefits of deciding when the valves opened, you couldn't really change how far they opened or for how long, not until they released Valvetronic. These days, there aren't really any cars on the market left that don't use some sort of valve adjustment mechanism. Ford's got VCT, Nissan has VVL, Porsche has Vario Cam, and I would have an aneurysm trying to list all of them. So to sum it up, Honda's VTEC changed the world. It brought cheap, fast cars for us to buy used in high school and hoon around in the parking lot behind Walmart. And it introduced this new radical concept called using technology to build power instead of just making the engine bigger. But between you and me, even though it was insanely reliable and cost effective to make, I never really thought they did the whole variable valve timing thing the best. You do get the best of both worlds, but with the Honda system, you completely miss all the spaces in between. It's either full race car or humdrum eco box. And when it kicks in, it's right now. Sort of like driving an 80s turbo car or a modern car with a turbo that's just way too big for its own good. It's nothing, 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 nothing. Bam, full send. It's a lot of fun sometimes, but there's something that feels almost crude about it. Maybe it's just me. The world is evolving past things like VTEC now. Stuff like Koenigsegg's free valve tech and ultra modern hyper efficient turbochargers and battery assisted boost mechanisms. They're here, making inventions like Honda's VTEC system matter less and less as time marches forward. We can't end things that way though, so here's some more awesome VTEC footage to wrap this up with.
Guys, thanks so much for watching this episode of Launch Control. VTech is rad and we just wanted to tell the story of it. I wanna know how you think we did on this one. Did you like it? Did you learn anything? Is there something we missed? If you like the video, let us know that with a thumbs up button. It really helps us out. And consider subscribing if you haven't already. Check us out on TikTok at Ideal Cars. And if you're looking for something to read, go check out the blog at ideal.media. I'll see you guys next week.